were in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, for the arraignment of Isaiah Gardenhire. The 40-year-old was arrested after reportedly going on a two-day crime spree that forced a community into lockdown. Gardenhire reportedly sexually assaulted his girlfriend in her home, then killed her 13-year-old daughter before fleeing to a nearby apartment complex. There, he allegedly took a man and woman hostage, sexually assaulted the female, robbed them, and then stole their car. Gardenhire would eventually turn himself into police. But now, as Judge Sarah Spencer Noggle reads the long list of charges against him, Count one, homicide, open murder, statutory short form. Count two, criminal sexual conduct, first degree, weapon use. He appears to nod off. DNA to be taken upon arrest. A consecutive sentence may be imposed under statute if the assault is uh, uh, confinement. Uh, Count six is unlawful imprisonment. Moments later, another audible yawn distracts from the hearing. Sting DNA to be taken upon arrest. The court may impose consecutive sentence under statute. And it is also a tier three offense. But the judge stays on track and asks prosecuting attorney David Barbary to weigh in on Gardenhire's bond conditions. Uh, looking at Mr. Gardenhire's criminal history, it's pretty significant. Uh, his criminal history consists of violent offenses, uh, weapons offenses, failures to appear in court. The prosecutor also mentions that Gardenhire was actually out on bond for a separate criminal sexual misconduct case in another county when he went on the alleged two-day crime spree. Uh, in this case, due to the fact that Mr. Gardenhire is both charged with murder and the fact that he was on bond at the time of the allegations occurred, charge her with murder because she's the one who did it. With the prosecutor mid-sentence, Gardenhire interrupts, claiming that his girlfriend should be charged with the murder of her daughter. Not him. Charge her with murder because she's the one who did it. Isaiah. Uh, talk. Oh, else? No. All right. Yeah. Mr. Garden Hire, this is your warning. The court will mute your microphone if you speak out of turn again. Your Honor, we would request that Mr. Garden Hire be held without bond, or in the alternative, that bond be set at $2 million cash jury. All right. Thank you. Mr. Barbary. Mr. Garden Hire, I'm going to ask that you behave in a all right, Massey behave in a manner that is appropriate for a court proceeding, particularly given the fact that right now I'm considering whether or not to allow your release on bond. If I have any more acting out, sir, we're going to turn off your audio and your video. Go ahead and mute his audio and video. Thank you. After further discussing his bond conditions, Garden Hire is brought back into the conversation, seemingly even less interested than before. All right, the court has considered the factors found in MCR 6.106 and finds that bond in the amount of $3 million, cash or surety, is appropriate. This time, the defendant flips the judge the bird, first with one hand, then follows it up with a hearing-ending two-hander. All right, go ahead and turn his video off, please. The hearing was ultimately cut short due to Garden Hire's behavior. Isaiah Gardenhire is being held on $3 million bond for 12 criminal charges, including home invasion, first-degree criminal sexual misconduct, and murder. Next, we go to Omaha, Nebraska, for the sentencing of former Dr. Anthony Garcia, the man responsible for a string of murders that have become known as the Creighton Killings. In 2008, Garcia went to the home of his ex-boss, Dr. William Hunter, seeking revenge against the man who fired him from his Creighton University residency seven years earlier. There, Garcia stabbed and killed both the doctor's 11-year-old son, Thomas, and housekeeper, Shirley Sherman. The case went unsolved until 2013, when Garcia returned to Omaha, this time killing Dr. Roger Brumbach another former Creighton employer, as well as his wife, Mary. Garcia was charged with four counts of murder and multiple weapons charges, and in 2016, found guilty on all charges. Prosecutors in his case are seeking the maximum penalty for Garcia, death. State of Nebraska versus Anthony Garcia. Two years later, as Garcia appears before a panel of judges to learn his sentence, 
The man is asleep, or at least pretending to be asleep, even while several family members deliver heartfelt impact statements to the court. We've heard a lot from the press, especially about after today, we'll finally get closure. So when you have a loved one taken from you in such a vicious, inhumane manner, that'll never happen. Young child of 11 and 3 quarters years should never have to innocently lose his life in a fit of anger. I'm left with constant images from courtroom photos of my mom laying there in a pool of her own blood with an eight-inch butcher knife hanging out her neck. I can't get those images ever out of my head. While Garcia still looks as if he's napping, District Judge Rick Schreiner addresses the court. The defendant traveled from his home in Indiana to Omaha, Nebraska, to commit four murders on two separate occasions. Those facts suggest lengthy premeditation and an exceptionally depraved mentality. The defendant had five years to reflect on the gruesomeness of the first two murders before he returned to Omaha to commit two more murders. He had no remorse after the first two murders. In fact, he bragged about them. As the judge moves to sentence him, Garcia remains still. The defendant now stands convicted of four murders. Until finally, he shows some slight movement. The panel finds that a sentence of death is not excessive. It is therefore ordered as to count one murder in the first degree. that a sentence of death is imposed upon the defendant, Anthony Garcia. Not even a sentence of death can wake the slumbering Garcia. Mr. Garcia, you are remanded to the custody of the Douglas County Sheriff for execution of this sentence. Altogether, Garcia receives 136 years for the weapons charges and a spot on death row at the Tecumseh State Correctional Facility. We're adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. We're in Waukesha, Wisconsin, for the case against 39-year-old Daryl Brooks. Brooks has been charged with six counts of intentional homicide, 61 counts of recklessly endangering safety with a dangerous weapon, and a number of other charges. A year earlier, police say Brooks met up with his ex-girlfriend, and they had an argument. Brooks then drove his mother's car into a crowd of people during the Waukesha Christmas Parade. Six people between the ages of 8 and 81 were killed, and over 60 were injured. Brooks fled the scene on foot, but showed up a short time later on the front steps of a stranger's home less than a mile away. A doorbell camera captured Brooks pleading to use the owner's telephone. Hey, can I, I'm, calling some, I'm calling an Uber, and I'm supposed to be waiting for it over here, but I don't know when it's coming. Can you call it for me, please? Police who'd been patrolling the area spotted Brooks, who fit the description of the suspect, and he was taken into custody. When police interviewed Brooks, he claimed not to know why he was there. Tell me what happened. With what? With the car. What am I being with your mom's car? Brooks was charged with 75 felonies and one misdemeanor. He considered a number of pleas, including not guilty by reason of mental defect, before ultimately deciding to plead not guilty. Today at a pretrial hearing, Brooks falls asleep during testimony, which gets the attention of the prosecutor. I observed that for about the past 40 minutes, Mr. Brooks appears to be asleep in the courtroom. I don't know if he's just being disrespectful, uninterested, or if he's not feeling well. After a brief recess, Brooks becomes irate when Judge Jennifer Doro reminds him that the proceedings are being recorded. You got something to say to? Mr. Brooks, the live stream is on. I don't care about no live stream. Just like y'all don't care. All this political. Mr. Brooks, you sit look here and act like you know me. People like you don't. Mr. Brooks. Mr. Brooks. Don't push back then. Mr. Brooks. Don't push back. Push me again. Mr. Mr. Brooks, we have to continue with this hearing. Don't put your hand on me, dude. Nobody put their hands on you. Hey, yeah, they better not put their hand on you. Don't touch me, dog. They see it. They see it. Five weeks later, when the case went to trial, Brooks decided to act as his own lawyer. I just want this I'm to be fair, and it hasn't been fair. All while continuing 
is bad behavior. And it's disrespectful to me that you think I would come in here purposely and treat this like a joke or a game. Your life is not on the line. Mine is. The judge moved him out of the main courtroom and into an adjacent one to argue his case remotely. We are back on the record. But the antics continue as Brooks removed his clothes and turned his back to the camera and later built himself a miniature fort using cardboard boxes. The trial lasted three weeks, and when both sides came to rest, it took the jury less than three hours to return with a verdict. Guilty on all 76 charges, including six counts of intentional homicide. Before Brooks is sentenced, several family members deliver impact statements to the court. It offends me that you're sitting here breathing while she is not. You are a monster. You deserve contempt and death. As for me, this will never be over until the day I'm pissing on your grave. I think it would be fair to say that for your crimes, even God hates you. Mr. Brooks, I hope as I read my statement, you continue to roll your eyes. I think it's important for the world to see what human rot looks like. Yeah, shake your head. There's nothing this court can do that would provide justice in my eyes. So all I ask is that you brought, and you brought slow. Judge Doro sentenced Brooks to life in prison with no chance for parole. Next, we go to Yolo County Superior Court in Woodland, California for a pretrial hearing. Seven months earlier, 42-year-old Corey Berlew was arrested and charged with attempted grand theft, more than $400, attempted theft of a vehicle, possession of burglary tools, and possession of a controlled substance. Today, Berlew is before Judge David Rosenberg for a status update on plea negotiations between his lawyer, David Nelson, and the state's attorney, David Wilson. Berlew is attending the hearing virtually, and as he waits for the judge to wrap up another case. Monday, the 24th of October at nine o'clock. Did you know that was United Nations Day? He nods off. And Berlew's sleepiness seems to be infectious. Uh, Mr. Clerk, what else do we have left besides Clementine? We still have the Berlew matter. Mr. Berlew is waiting patiently. Berlew wakes up, just as his name is mentioned, but then dozes off again. This time, the judge takes notice. That's a first. I have never had uh, someone just, have you seen someone doze off? Uh, you've seen that before? I sure. think. <laughs> no, on, on Zoom, you know? I think someone needs to go and poke him with a stick. No, he looks so comfortable. Yeah, He's sitting yeah. there in his garage or somewhere. Oh, well. So, Mr. Nelson, uh, what are you going to do about your your client? Is, has he appeared or is he absent? Well, he appeared before I did, but... <laughs> <laughs> you try to call him? I did, Your Honor, and I don't think he's got his phone on. Because Berlew still hasn't woken up, the state's attorney asks to adjourn the hearing. I would ask that we come back later this week. I'm thinking of this afternoon. I Are you going to be I here? can be here this afternoon, Your Honor. Well, the question is, is the defendant going to be here this well, afternoon? Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I would continue it till 1.30 today. Thank you for your patience, Your Honor. Whatever you do, do not, do not wake him. I mean, just leave him on Zoom. Don't disconnect. Quite a shock when he wakes up. Judge Rosenberg moves on to the next case. But a short time later, Berlew wakes up. So the judge interrupts proceedings to get his attention. Oh, Mr. Berlew. Oh, can, wait one moment, everyone. Mr. Berlew, can you hear can you hear me? Give me the thumbs up if you can hear me. Thumbs up is given. Uh, did you know you had uh, dozed off? Got a cold, I'm sick. Yeah, I'm sorry to wake you, but uh, you're in court. So st stand by. We're going to call your matter in about 15 seconds, okay? Yeah. 
All right. So uh, as to the Menifee matter, the request to... Berlou looks like he's still battling the Sandman, but he manages to stay awake until he's called again. What has been resolved in this case? It's here for pre-hearing conference. Your Honor, uh, Mr. Berlou had uh, authorized me basically to negotiate a grant of probation. That has been now offered by the district attorney's office. We need a plea. Yes, Your Honor. And then we need to get probation terms. So, Mr. Berlou, uh, we, we do need you to come back uh, on Friday at 9 o'clock. Apparently, they're going to offer you a grant of probation, but we need to have you uh, plead. Okay? Yeah. Four days later, at his next hearing, Berlou pled no contest to attempted grand theft more than $400. The other charges were dismissed. He remains free on bond, awaiting sentencing. Next, we go to district court in Ann Arbor, Michigan. 27-year-old Albana Methasani is before Judge Cedric Simpson for a virtual sentencing hearing. Almost two years earlier, Methasani was arrested for possession of a controlled substance and disturbing the peace. She's since taken a deal, pleading guilty to a lesser charge of using a controlled substance. The disturbing the peace charge has been dropped. Are you Miss uh, Methasani? Hey, it's my best friend. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm okay. Court calls the case, Albana Methasani. Yeah, it's, it's me. I just woke up, so. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, Assistant Public Defender Melissa Kleeman on behalf of Ms. Methasani. She was referred for competency. Um, we did get the report back. She was found to be competent. Um, a PSIR was not done. Um, so we are just asking to refer her for the PSIR um, and to get a new sentencing date. All right. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. So here's what I'm gonna do, Ms. Methasani, in your case is I'm gonna re-refer you for a PSI, so you'll talk to my probation officer, and then I'm going to adjourn this sentencing date to August 10, 2022 at nine, okay? But I do get to leave jail, correct? Well, I currently, what do you have her bond? I currently have her bond at 10,000, 10%, but... Well, can we make it at zero because I have... <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Methasani's bond in this case was originally set at $10,000. She would have to post 10% or $1,000 to be released from jail, which she does not have. Right, so here's the thing. Um, my mom said if I can get it down to $500, then she may be possibly be able to bail me out. So here's what I'm going to do, Miss Mas <laughs> Miss Mastasani. Ah, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Just help me out. You know, I don't mind paying. Like I, I can find a way to get a hold of my mom, but maybe like lower it a little bit or. Well, that's what I was going to do. I'll, I'll lower it to $7,500. I'll give a 10% privilege on that, OK? OK. Judge Simpson has reduced the bond that Methasani has to post in cash to $750. Now she just has to talk to her mom. So um, do I have permission to use the phones to call my mom? They always tell me that I can't and I have to use the ones that, you know, you pay for. Can you give some kind of order? <laughs> You're using the same phones that okay, they Okay, I'm the president. <laughs> Screw it. I'm the president. I'm going to tell them. Okay. You go and you tell them that and let me know then how it goes. You're a funny guy. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I share I'm, I'm going to miss talking to you. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll talk again. <laughs> okay. Hopefully not. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Despite Judge Simpson lowering her bond, 
Methusani has not made bail and remains in jail pending sentencing. Next, we go to district court in Detroit, Michigan for a pretrial hearing. 21-year-old Jalen Pierre Adams has been charged with harboring a minor. Two months earlier, Adams was arrested for harboring a 14-year-old runaway girl at his home. He pled not guilty, posted bond of $20,000, and was required to wear a GPS tether. Today, Adams appears before Judge Elanise Bryant to discuss next steps in the case. He's being represented by public defender Janice Stevenson. As Judge Bryant calls the case, there's something about the defendant that catches her eye. Uh, Mr. Adams, do you, uh, do you have on a bathrobe? Because when we brought you in earlier, you were sleeping. Your head was down on the table, you were asleep, and now you have on a bathrobe. So I need you to go get dressed for court, and then I'm going to bring you back out later. After going through a few other cases, the judge has Adams return to the call. But there's still an issue. And he sleep again. I'm not going to do... What? Do you all know Mr. Adams' phone number? Text him again, Judge, yes. I mean, what is... <sighs> Adams returns, but Judge Bryant is not happy with his behavior, and she lets him know it. Mr. Adams, sit up straight. Sit up straight and stop being asleep when I bring you into this courtroom. You are at court. It is inappropriate for you to come to court like this. That's inappropriate. Today is the day set for a pretrial conference. How are we proceeding? Mr. Adams will continue his plea of not guilty. Stevenson then makes a request regarding her client's GPS tether. There was a GPS tether and a curfew ordered. Mr. Adams absolutely understood the magistrate's order that he should have no contact with the complaining witness, and he has had no contact with that individual, Your Honor. So I am asking at this time that the tether be removed. Is he on house arrest? He's on a curfew and a GPS tether. 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. curfew. This is really a serious situation. Because I can't imagine if my child go missing and then you know where the child is and you won't tell me, you won't let me know that they're safe. He put himself in a situation where he could be accused of a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, so I'm not going to remove the tether, but I'll change the curfew from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Okay. All right, anything further? Thank Did you. you raise your hand just now? It looks like the defendant wants to say something. So what time is my curfew time? Because I know it was 8 to 8. From 11 p.m. to 5 a.m., you have to be at home. So between 11 a.m. and 5 p.m., I have to be at home? Between 11 p.m., 11 at night. At night. So when, when 11 o'clock at night come, you have to be home. And then you can't leave your house again until 5 o'clock in the morning. Yes, ma'am. You will yes, probably be Honor. asleep, though. You're going to be asleep. Adams will remain on a GPS tether until further notice. His case is pending. If found guilty, he could be sentenced to a year in prison. Thanks for being a fan of Court Cam. Subscribe to AE to never miss a new video and catch full episodes on AETV.com.